just six votes. That is the closest congressional race in Iowa history. Just because these results are official doesn't mean it's the end for this process. Democratic leadership is trying to use brute political power to kick her out. There were three seats in Iowa that we knew we had a chance to flip from Democrat to Republican, uh, and that was one of them. If you look you know, at maybe the Washington experts, they probably had that as the longest shot uh, to, to win. But you know, Marionette was, was a really strong candidate, you know, medical doctor, and she really, I think, connected with a lot of people. I got a degree in nursing, enlisted in the Army at age 18, and um, so I stayed in the military, both active duty and reserve. For 24 years, ultimately did become a doctor. Both my husband and I retired as uh, as lieutenant colonels from the Army Reserve. Obviously, we had um, a very close election, six votes in Iowa, and people don't always like the outcome of an election, but Iowans respect when an election is uh, counted, recounted, and certified by a bipartisan board, um, and that's how our process in Iowa works. The controversy is all about the 2nd Congressional District in Iowa, represented by Republican Congresswoman Marinette Miller-Meeks. She defeated in November, according to Iowa state officials, Democrat Rita Hart, by, get this, just six votes, one of the closest elections in American history. But Hart is saying she actually won the election and the 22 ballots were not counted that should have been. Each House of Congress shall be the judge of its own elections. As a result, the House Committee on Administration has started investigating whether they swore in the wrong member of Congress. Republicans are furious. We're having a meeting to move forward with overturning an election of one of our colleagues that was certified using a bipartisan and transparent process. But so far, the committee hasn't dismissed calls to drop the challenge and investigation continues. These allegations warrant further investigation by the committee. Well, on the Republican side, we knew this whole thing was an egregious abuse of power. And so, you know, under under uh, Ranking Member Davis's leadership, what we knew we had to do was shine light on this. We were looking for the truth. We were looking for what actually happened because you have to justify whether or not Congress or the House of Representatives is going to intervene in that election. What you're looking for are things that were done unconstitutionally or illegally or improperly. None of that happened. I, I don't think the, the average member, let alone the average uh, citizen, uh, was really aware of what the Democratic leadership was trying to do uh, and the tricks that they were willing to play to try to expand uh, their vote total here in the House. We did a couple different recounts. Congresswoman Miller Meeks was never behind. So I always thought, oh, they couldn't go there, they couldn't go there. But then when it became swearing in day, and um, they challenged it. It really made me nervous. You had a few members who were around in the 1980s and they started talking about what they called the bloody eighth. And, and they called it that because it was a really bloody fight um, where the Republican won the seat in Indiana and lo and behold, the Democrats were in the majority and they just took it away. In an unprecedented action, the House voided the certificate of election and decided to seat neither candidate. They, they had a vote even though the, the Republican was ahead in Indiana, they took that seat away and, and voted it out in Washington, D.C. Rick McIntyre arrived at the House of Representatives on January 3rd, 1985, with a valid certificate of election issued by the Indiana Secretary of State. Never before in our history has a congressman-elect been denied a seat if he has had an undisputed certificate of election. This is a sad day in the history of the U.S. House of Representatives. I think many of us here feel like weeping for our country because the Constitution has been trampled, two centuries of precedents have been thrown out the window, and Indiana law has been trashed, as have its elected officials. And we do believe that Rick McIntyre remains the duly elected and certified member from the state of Indiana, and we're very, very sad that in America, in the U.S. House of Representatives, the sacred right of people to vote and have their votes counted honestly and fairly has been lost in the action that was taken. As many times as I'd read the Constitution, I never realized that Article 1, Section 5 of the Constitution meant that Congress could actually pick its members, meant that they could overthrow a duly certified election. We had a plan for the recount. 
uh, in all 24 counties. We had a plan if our opponent went to court. And it was a three-pronged strategy. So we had a communication strategy, a legal strategy, and then a political strategy. And all of those uh, things had to work together. They had to coexist together because if we did something um, on communications that made it harder for us to make our case in court, it would undermine us. Our opponent uh, and their law firm had over you know 55 lawyers in state. We had our you know uh, uh, you know two two paid attorneys and our team and our volunteers going up against this mammoth machine and and I really mean that so we were the you know we were the David and they were the Goliath and we just took them on full force uh, we were polite we were nice uh, we were always upbeat and we just really worked our tails off to get a win now Miller Meeks also released a statement saying quote I am proud to have won this contest and look forward to being certified as the winner on Monday I think what's really important is that, um, you know, having been in the military, having been both a nurse and a doctor, um, I think it's important for people to know that they have a voice and they have someone that's there to work for them and represent them. So throughout all this process, it didn't matter if I was going to be in Congress one week or, you know, uh, you know, 52 weeks, um, people in Iowa deserve to have somebody represent them. Uh, it's just amazing. Iowa traditionally is a purple state. I mean, if you look at the last elections, uh, Obama won back to back and then Trump won back to back. So we knew going into the, this last election that it could be very tight, especially in, in a lot of congressional races. And, and they were. And it was just amazing to see uh, Dr. Miller Meeks uh, pull this one out. Well, on election night, we had uh, won by considerably more votes than we ended up winning by. Uh, and so on election night, we were extremely happy. We were elated that we had won. Uh, we uh, believed that the count was, you know, accurate where we were. But we also knew that it was so close that there was going to be a recount. So we celebrated for about an hour to an hour and a half and then went into what do we do to make sure that this uh, election result stays with us through the rest of the contest. We're realizing what races are, you know, done and outside the recount margin and we're taking those off our legal watch list and Iowa 2 was still on there. It was still on there the next morning and I think it was really the next day um, as it sort of evolved. We realized that Iowa 2 and New York 22 were really going to be our top priorities of races to watch in the coming weeks. As soon as the county auditors had turned in their official uh, count their uh, county audit. She could have requested the recount, but she didn't. She waited until the very last day to request a recount. So that process was unveiling. I don't think anybody thought that they were going to spend uh, the weeks leading up to Thanksgiving uh, counting and recounting ballots, but it was it was really interesting to watch. The Marionette Miller Meeks campaign feels confident as the last county in Iowa's second congressional district will complete the district wide recount. The Republican currently leads Democrat Rita Hart by just eight votes. That's down from her 47 vote lead before the recount in an election where more than 300,000 Iowans cast their ballots. And so that margin had slipped down. But when we knew that we were going to land just on the positive side of the ledger, that was a hugely important moment. And then the next moment that was really important was three days later when the Hart campaign announced that it was not going to pursue a contest of the election under state law. We were getting ready for an Iowa contest court to be convened by the Supreme Court of Iowa. Well, we spent a lot of time trying to make sure we're prepared for the worst you know, and hope for the best. So we are training our, our election officials, whether it's the persons working at the precinct level, your friends and neighbors, when you put a bipartisan team of Republican and Democrat at the polling sites, they're supposed to be doing a, a very key and important role. The auditor themselves has a series of che checks and balances. Uh, I mean, 40-some uh, just with the election equipment itself. And then you've got all the others that go in involved with the, uh, how they transcribe the early results uh, to give us the uh, early reporting for the public on election night. But there's so much more than that as uh, we go into the next day when they actually have to start verifying that every, all their I's are dotted and T's are crossed. Uh, and uh, that's when you know, we discovered a couple uh, blips, if you will, that needed to be fixed. And uh, they were honest things, some human error, and uh, they were quickly uh, corrected because they were identified as they were supposed to be. So it wasn't a surprise. And it was well before the final canvas. But uh, at the end of the process, uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a close one. And we had, we, we had a winner. 
The results were certified by a bipartisan board of Iowa officials, sending Miller Meeks to Washington. I'm proud that a narrow majority of you elected me as your next member of Congress. Meanwhile, both my opponent and I were at orientation in Washington, D.C. So that was the middle of um, the middle of November before Thanksgiving. So during that time, when I was at orientation, a, a certain congressman, Congressman Rodney Davis, came up to me and was talking to me and informed me that, well, this is if Nancy Pelosi seats you. And I looked at him and I said, well, what do you mean? Remember on Election Day, you had Speaker Pelosi and the chair of her Democrat campaign congressional committee talking about how they expected to pick up 15 to 25 seats on election night, just a few hours later. And instead, Republicans lost zero incumbents and we were able to win double digit new members of Congress, including Marionette Miller Meeks, who after the state of Iowa and local election officials did recounts they did certifications that were done in a bipartisan way. It showed that Congresswoman Miller Meeks won by six votes. And even after that, even after that was certified in a bipartisan way by Iowa's election officials, Speaker Pelosi knew that she could get the challenger, Rita Hart, to bypass the courts in Iowa and file, a, a, file the paperwork to have the House determine whether or not Congresswoman Miller Meeks was certified the winner. It's a process that's been used a few times, most recently in 1985. As soon as Rodney Davis uh, had mentioned to me that, um, that uh, Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House and the House could overthrow the election, the House Committee on Administration came in, sent teams in, and they were on the ground with us throughout the entire recount process. So January 3rd, which is opening day, it was a Sunday, um, is traditionally um, a, a day that is exciting and, and a lot going on, but, but very much scripted. Um, there's obviously the speaker vote, and then the uh, rules package is adopted. Uh, the members are sworn in. Um, but by and large, it's a day of celebration um, for a lot of people, particularly the freshmen. It's kind of like the first day of school for them. Uh, but in this instance, um, we knew it could have a little bit more meaning uh, because there was a chance that when all of the, the members were sworn in, um, that she may not have been. So it was actually through a TV interview that we found out that I, in fact, was going to be sworn in. To date, only transition and opening day that was done during a, the COVID pandemic. And so the way they were swearing in members was a bit different too, and it was in waves rather than the traditional route, which is everybody all at once. And so um, we were involved with the logistics of, of how we were gonna get folks, uh, members to the floor when they needed to be there, but then also a special eye on um, uh, Marionette Miller Meeks to make sure uh, she was in fact sworn in. That seemed like such a significant moment and that the American people watched this woman take the oath her name was on the board. She had an office. She was functioning like any other member of Congress and that um, that's what should have happened. She should have been sworn in. And so it was gonna be a terrible, terrible process and a precedent for the speaker and the majority to unseat a member of Congress who had been sworn in in front of the American people. Mary Miller Meeks was the duly elected member of Congress from Iowa. Let's move forward. But instead, we went through this long charade spent over a million dollars in legal fees of taxpayer dollars on this, on a case that never should have moved forward. When they go to Washington, they understand it's the people's house, not Pelosi's house. And the idea that Democrats want to turn over an election after it's been counted, recounted, and a bipartisan election board had voted, it's time to move on. Because of all the attention that was given to the 24 counties, uh, it was pretty hard to argue the results. Uh, I mean, that's why we were a little perplexed when there were rumors going on that the Speaker of the House might be doing something different by pulling out a, a, a part of the law that most of us weren't even aware was there to give them the ability to override what we in Iowa said the results were and who we voted for. Frankly, I think she admitted in one of her filings where she talked about practical considerations, I believe was the wording. 
Um, I mean, I think it's, it's pretty obvious why she did it. She didn't think that she had great legal arguments in Iowa, and that bore out with some of the arguments she made in terms of the process and the application of law and gap filling, as she, saw, as she called it, for her friends in the majority. Um, but frankly, I, I think it was as simple as she thought this was the best chance to win. And so to me, there was only one way to, that, we could, that we could get the result that we need, um, and that is to um, take this to the, to the Committee on House Administration. Well, clearly, uh, and I think the Des Moines Register even pointed it out, uh, she thought her chances were better going to uh, the uh, Democrat-controlled House uh, than it would have been going to uh, the Iowa Supreme Court. That's just disrespectful to the uh, people that voted in the election. It's disrespectful to uh, Iowans in general. I think Nancy Pelosi all along uh, was intent on getting that seat because she only had a five seat majority. Now, if I wanted to be unfair, I wouldn't have seated the, Dem the Republican from Iowa because that was my right on the opening day. I would have just said, they're not seated. And that would have been my right as speaker to do. But we didn't want to do that. We just said, let's just go through this process. Many members were saying, don't seat the person. You know, you're, you're naming a few who are saying, let's move on. But I'm saying then people said, why should we seat somebody to have votes for all this time when their election is being contested? And we said, no, we will seat the member and then we'll go through the normal process. But it would have been under the rules allowable for me to say, we're not seating the member from Iowa. We did not do that. Uh, it really put the speaker in an awkward position if she was not going to seat Marinette Miller Meeks. And, uh, you know, she probably was thinking back to 1985 when the Democrats literally did this in Indiana's 8th district uh, with a bigger margin. Instead of challenging the certification that Dr. Miller Meeks now has in her possession in court, the Democrat candidate has decided to skip that step and instead is going to ask Washington Democrats to overturn Iowa's voters. But a little known fact about the Committee on House Administration is that it has jurisdiction over all federal elections. And little did I know when I got on this committee to deal with, you know, who wants a parking spot where or who needs a new chair or refrigerator in their office, little did I know that I would come to Congress a few years later and watch one of the closest elections in American history in Iowa's second district uh, be challenged by the Democrats who were in the majority. And that challenge was going to run through this small committee. It's the smallest full committee in Congress. We have six Democrats and three Republicans. Not just me as ranking, not just me as ranking member. We've got Barry Loudermilk from Georgia and Brian Stile from Wisconsin. And we are a small member committee, but we are dedicated and we are tenacious. And we could not wait to fight Nancy Pelosi, who wanted to unseat the duly elected member of Congress, Marinette Miller Meeks. Now, fortunately, federal election contests don't happen that often. Uh, they're, they're thankfully fairly rare. I think that speaks well for our whole system. But that means that the, not every question in the rules has ever been addressed or seen. A lot of questions are matters of first impression. Um, and, and there are very few people who have worked through the process in the past. I was very surprised because historically the arguments that the Democrats would proffer in, you know, regarding election contests was that you had to exhaust state remedies. They had argued that, you know, in past election contests and in fact prior to um, the 2006 election when the committees, um, the majority and the minority were talking, the so Republicans were in the majority in 2006 and then became, you know, were in the minority because they lost control in 2007. In conversations with the Democrats, the Democrats wanted to have rules in place where, you know, con contestants would be required to exhaust state remedies. So the fact that they made a significant departure from what their position has been for many, many years, you know, kind of signaled to me that they skipped the state you know, process that was available in Iowa because they realized that it wouldn't be advantageous for their position and that they should just completely move forward and go to the House. So to me, that told me that this was going to be a partisan contest. Setting this precedent that you don't have to exhaust all of your options and prove your case in court, but that whatever party is in charge of the House can come in, change the rules and determine the winner is a terrible 
precedent to set. So the committee finally started to meet, um, and, and what is actually really interesting about, about the way about, about saying meet is that this was still in uh, the, the period of time when vaccines were not widely available. Um, I think they've been available, this is January, February, February, I guess, 2021. Vaccines were available to members and to staff, but the committee is still meeting mostly virtually. So um, for, for the meetings that we would have, the business meetings, one in particular, we had a room in Rayburn where the three Republican members, Ranking Member Davis, Mr. Loudermilk and Mr. Style, were at a table together, but they reach on their own webcams. And the Democratic members were in various, not all in the same place, various places, their own webcams. But the committee's meeting this way, right? And uh, at that time, um, we're finally moving forward in the official piece of this. And what we were looking at was uh, Hart hadn't exhausted the state remedies before she came to Congress. Now, that's not strictly required, but it's definitely an argument in favor of moving forward at the congressional level. Every single time we had a hearing, uh, our members on the Republican side would ask questions about what the Democrats' intentions were. And based on comments publicly made by Speaker Pelosi, the Democrats in Washington had every intention to try and go through this process, which would have eventually led to Congresswoman Miller Meeks being unseated and Rita Hart being seated in her place against the will of Iowa's voters in the U.S. House of Representatives. It would be an extremely rare move. From 1933 to 2009, the House has considered 107 contested election cases. Only three have led to the seating of a candidate who contested the results. Republicans are calling this a hypocritical partisan power grab, pointing to criticism by Democrats of former President Trump's attempts to overturn the results of the November election. It became a very odd juxtaposition where on one hand, Democrats were being highly critical of the Trump campaign who went into states and filed legal challenges. There were irregularities that were cited and well-documented uh, in some of those states. And then here in Iowa, there were no irregularities that were reported opening the door for the full House to decide the election and potentially replace Miller Meeks with Hart. We'll see that where that takes us. Yeah, but there could be a scenario to that extent. We have um, a Democrat state auditor who is on the panel that certifies these elections and signs election certificates alongside our governor and our secretary of state and the other electeds in the state. So um, when I look at um, that, that process, and I saw how it worked out well in Iowa, and to see uh, the the Speaker of the House so blatantly disregard our state um, in, in its right to conduct its own election. I mean, I wish I could say I was surprised, but really I'm incredibly disappointed. It was, it was really disappointing. I mean, first of all, we have a bipartisan canvassing board, and they did a great job. And no one at all ever said that the system was broken or that there's problems. We also have a, a situation that if somebody sees a problem that they can adjudicate, that they can go to court with it. And uh, Rita Hart, who Dr. Miller Meeks was running against, she never took it to court. So everyone understood that it was a fair election. And I look at that and say, we have a gold standard election system in Iowa. And it's just disappointing for the media and everybody else in DC saying, well, it was unfair and stuff. And in Iowa, no one was ever saying that because they knew the election was fair, both sides. Uh, and so trying to remove Marriott Miller Meeks, a sitting member of the House of Representatives, uh, was something that you didn't think would happen, uh, but it was clearly the building approach that they were using uh, to try to gain influence here in the House of Representatives. So you know, kind of your gut says you can't imagine uh, Nancy Pelosi being so egregious uh, to try to remove a sitting member of Congress. But that's exactly what they were trying to do uh, when House administration really went into action to raise awareness uh, to the American people. Ordinarily, the burden is on the loser to establish that they really won. But what the majority tried to do was force the Republican to submit the evidence that the Republican had to show that she won. That's not how the law works. That process is, is later on. In other words, the loser, in this case, the Democrat, needs to make the case. And then the Republican gets to take discovery and question that evidence. Here they wanted to do everything at the, at the threshold. The Republican would have no opportunity 
to prove their case when they have no obligation to prove a case? How do they know what voters did vote and not vote? It put the Republican candidate in the position almost as the state's election official, as if, as if, as if she were the secretary of state or something. That's not the role of the candidate, right? And by doing that move, the Democrats tried to create the appearance of fairness by saying, well, we're letting both sides tell us their story today, but not acknowledging that the law provides for a process that would allow for actually better discovery and more fairness. So it was an interesting sleight of hand they tried to pull on the discovery. And fortunately, the team saw it and were able to, to counteract it. We thought we had a pretty good case because she was certified the winner. I mean, at some point, even if it's six votes, five votes, or one vote, somebody's got to win. And she was certified by state officials in a bipartisan way as the winner. And our job then became making sure that every single Democrat, including Speaker Pelosi, that, that was in the majority, knew that if they were to begin this process of trying to determine a new outcome in Iowa's second district, that they were thwarting the will of Iowa's voters. We were prepared to use every tool that we had. I mean, clearly being in the minority, uh, they have the majority of votes, but we had some legislative tools and, and just the ability to raise public awareness and, and, and go to the mats on it. And the fact that you're not even trying to go to the state of Iowa where this election occurred and, and make a, a legal challenge, which the law allowed, you didn't even try to do that. It was going to be uh, another really, really ugly fight on the floor, uh, like what people told us happened in the Indiana Bloody Eighth race. They didn't you know, think that there would be much media scrutiny. Uh, but I'll tell you what, you know, watching how Marionette Miller Meeks handled herself during this, I think really said a lot about our character, but also the people in Iowa started turning against what Pelosi was trying to do. I can tell you our phones were lighting up when, um, when all of this was playing out last January and February. And um, Iowans expected the outcome of an election to be respected. And to see that so blatantly disrespected through process here in Washington, D.C., it was everything people hate about Washington, D.C. playing out right in front of their eyes. That did not fly well with Iowans, and I can tell you our office was hearing from them, and I'm sure all offices in Iowa were hearing from voters who, who said, you have to stop this blatant takeover um, of our elections. And so um, Iowans on both sides of the aisle uh, respect our process and knew that that was the outcome of the election. 400,000 people in this district cast their ballot and they felt that they were gonna get disenfranchised. And they're gonna get disenfranchised by one person, the speaker uh, of the Democrats, making a decision to void out this election. There was a lot of frustration that Congress could actually choose who their members were instead of the people of the states and the individual congressional districts. We're in a, living in a time right now where the distrust of the federal government is at a historic high. Hardly anyone trusts the federal government to do what is in their interest, much less what is constitutional and what is right. And when you go through exercises like this where one party is trying to manipulate the system and manipulate and take advantage of the people just to increase their political power, that's very frustrating to the people and it actually causes them to mistrust the government and especially Congress even more. That's why Congress has such a low approval rating. In the end, I think you started seeing public, public pressure turn against Democrats' attempt to do this in Washington, uh, all across the country, because look, they had the votes to do it. They were trying to do it. If Pelosi felt she had 218 votes, I, I have no doubt she would have taken that seat away. And once there was a, more than five, which was the number that Pelosi couldn't afford to lose, and it was clear Pelosi no longer had the votes to do it, that's when Pelosi finally abandoned it. But it wasn't until people in our own party turned against her publicly because they were being asked back home about it. And, and a lot of people were, I think, starting to turn against this, this, this brazen attempt by Pelosi to move an election away uh, from Iowa and into Washington. So really under the leadership uh, of Ranking Member Davis, you start to see people's awareness of this case increase. And as more and more members became aware of it, and finally the mainstream media started asking Democrats questions and saying, do you actually support uh, this outrageous idea? And slowly, one after the other, 
came out against this approach of removing a sitting member of Congress for the political purpose of expanding the Democrats' majority. And finally, we got to, you know, six, seven members came out against it. And that's when the House of Cards finally fell. Because at that point, it was clear uh, to Democratic leadership that they didn't have the votes on the House floor to actually get this done. So on that day, there was a there was some sort of back and forth, if you recall, <clears throat> from between Chip Roy and Majority Leader Sidney Hoyer. <laughs> And I, I think if you recall, Mr. Roy stood up and, and made some sort of challenge that day, and then the majority leader responded. You know, I got to give Chip some credit. Uh, Chip stood up and, and offered up uh, a motion to make sure that everyone supported any certified electoral winner who was going to be sworn in on January 3rd. And every single Democrat voted for it. And if this unfair process based upon Rita Hart's petition to the Committee on House Administration would have gone forward. That would have been a great narrative for us to use that every single Democrat voted to seat Marionette before. Why in the world would they unseat her now other than pure politics? And my message was pretty clear to many of them. If you do this now, it's a terrible precedent to set because many of them could be in the exact same situation once the majority changed hands. And it was a good move for the speaker to pressure Rita Hart to withdraw her motion because I think it would have been a terrible precedent set during a time where this majority led by Democrats has already set some terrible precedents. So that was happened to be March 31st and I remember it because the next day was April 1st or April Fool's Day. You know, I was trying to encourage people to get vaccinated. And so I had started doing vaccine clinics and then ended up doing vaccine clinics and administering vaccines in all the 24 counties in the second congressional district. And so on that process, we had um, minority leader Kevin McCarthy coming into our state. Um, and part of this process in order to win was to get national attention and local attention, number one, that I was in fact a congresswoman, and number two, that they really were trying to steal a congressional seat. Uh, and it's not up to Congress to decide who gets to represent a district, it's up to the people of that district who voted. Rita Hart has withdrawn her contest to the second district election that would have gone before the House Committee on Administration. Hart deciding to challenge the results in the democratically led House instead of Iowa courts claiming 22 ballots were not counted. Miller Meeks though says it's just time to move on. Election law matters and I think state's law matters and this is I think for election integrity for people to have faith and confidence that their vote counts, that their election laws matter within their states, I think it was the right thing to do. My deputy chief calls me and once and I'm thinking he's calling to find out where I am because I'm now five minutes late, but he was calling me to let me know that uh, Rita Hart had my opponent had decided that they were going to end the contest and drop their petition. And my response was, okay, that's really great. Well, thank you so much. I'll call you back. I've got to go do a vaccine clinic. And within a few minutes trying to go upstairs to the vaccine clinic, my chief of staff called me to let me know the same thing. And I said, great, thank you so much. I've got to go give vaccines. And so, you know, I was focused on the fact that I was there to give vaccine clinics and do my job. And so I was going to do my job and then I could celebrate later. When I heard that Rita Hart withdrew the petition, uh, that was just the culmination day. That was that day where we got to declare victory. And that victory was even sweeter knowing that Leader McCarthy was in Iowa's second congressional district with Congresswoman Miller Meeks, and they were able to celebrate. Uh, but my celebration uh, didn't end with, with phone calls from them. Uh, it ended when I congratulated my team on House administration and my colleagues, Mr. Loudermilk and Mr. Style, for all the work that they put in that was behind the scenes and nobody knew about it, nobody talked about it, but we were ready. We were ready for that fight, and frankly, we were ready to end that fight. You know, I really didn't see it coming because, you know, if you're, if you're in the foxhole, it's hard to know how the war's going. And we were in the foxhole at that point, and we were getting ready for uh, a lot of depositions and a lot of litigation type activity that was gonna go on over the next several months to get ready for what looked like a full-on fight. Uh, and then all of a sudden, poof, it went away. I think the signs were there at the time. I didn't realize the signs were there because the Hart campaign was backing off of scheduled depositions of a lot of voters who they said were gonna come in and say certain things. 
and then all of a sudden they cancel the depositions and they can't prove it up. I didn't want to believe it was going to end at that point, uh, but then when they folded, it, it, it was a great feeling, to be honest, a little anticlimactic because you're just in it and now all of a sudden I have nothing to do and <laughs> had to go find something else to work on as a lawyer. But a great feeling and, and super satisfying to be able to deliver that message to the congresswoman that, hey, this is over, you're going to stay in this seat. I think uh, Ranking Member Davis did a, a terrific job recognizing that this was a lot bigger than um, just Iowa 2 or just our committee. And he really took uh, a leadership role in making sure the coordination was occurring across the board with everybody involved um, so that we could put ourselves in the best position possible to ensure uh, that the seat and election was not overturned. And I think Ranking Member Davis um, uh, rose to the occasion and um, did a terrific job with those efforts. Really, I give a lot of credit to the Republicans in the House administration, especially Rodney Davis and what he did in the hearings themselves, um, really making the case. We wanted to raise the attention so they couldn't just do an Indiana 8 when no one's looking. Uh, we wanted to bring it everywhere else. We wanted to put the facts out there so everybody knew um, that every single recount from each county, from also the Secretary of State who determined the certificate of who was there, all said Congresswoman Miller Meeks was there. So we raised the attention and then we literally went to the district itself. And what was interesting, we started hearing from people in the district. And you just went through a really contested election. So there were newspapers who had supported her opponent who now came out with editorials saying, drop this, this is wrong. So it was more raising the attention that if they were going to try to do this and cheat and seat somebody else, that um, the country was going to know about and know that it was wrong. And that was the really first stumble out right out of the gate by the majority was establishing a process that had not only had no basis in law, but violated the Contested Elections Act. The first recommendation I have is actually read the law. There is a federal statute that governs this. This was, this was built up over years. There have been issues in the past that resulted in Congress passing a law to govern this. Start there. Start with the, start with the statutory text. The majority wanted to deprive Congresswoman Miller Meeks of her rights to discovery and wanted to rush to judgment. And it was clear very early on that the majority was just trying to get this done as quickly as possible to the result that it had preordained. And I think all the communication strategy and all of the public relations and the political messaging around that for the minority was very, very strong. Uh, the team called that out early and often, beat that drum at every opportunity, and I think that's ultimately what turned the tide in this particular contest. You want to try to make sure the state rules are in place, that there's not unnecessary discretion among election officials as to what ballots count and not count. The same is true here at the House level, where the more you can iron this stuff out and lock it in, the less pressure there is uh, on the back end to play these games that the Democrats tried to play here. You know, one piece of advice I'd have for people who get into a situation like this is have a designated note taker, somebody whose job it is to document everything because it's very easy to be two or three days into something and think to yourself, I, I know this fact is true, but how do I know it? When did I learn that fact was true? What are the documents that prove it? And there's so much information coming in and so many decisions that have to be made that really you have to have somebody whose job it is just take notes and archive everything. I think we've increased awareness of people of the entire process. I think that's good. I think people have a better understanding of the, the power of the, the House of Representatives, but also how, you, how individuals can try to abuse that power. There's always going to be close races, and there should be um, an ability for the House administration to look at it, to make sure that people are trusted with it. But at no time should they predetermine the outcome. At no time should they make a decision that just because they have the majority of seats, that they can pick and choose who wins. Uh, the voters have the say, and the voters should have the power. But we have looked at seats when we were in the majority and didn't overturn, didn't. We, we take the outcome of what the voters have said. I feel that Congresswoman Miller Meeks got robbed of the joy of being a new congresswoman and you know, meeting her new constituents. There was always that doubt. 
never in our heads, but certainly um, what you're seeing in the media and what the, our opponent's team was putting out there to cast doubt on that. And that was really unfortunate because um, you know, there's a lot of meeting your freshman colleagues and getting your committee assignments and all of that, but uh, she didn't get to experience the true sort of uh, excitement and joy of these assignments and, and getting to represent people. I often would say that it's difficult on both families, and so I'm very empathetic to what my opponent went through because I too is going through it. It's extraordinarily difficult for your families. Campaigns are difficult for families uh, in and of themselves. It's hard to lose a campaign and then to get back up and run a campaign again. The federal government should not be taking over these elections, and we've frankly seen a dramatic shift um, in leadership trying to, to move in that direction with policies like HR1 and HR4, which would uh, in, in essence federalize our elections and would give Department of Justice, for example, huge new powers over our states that, um, that again, our founding fathers did not intend. So for, for us going forward, it's really about continuing to talk about um, why states should have those rights, because what works in Iowa might not work in Alaska, right? You've got a very different geographical area. You've got a, a different makeup in terms of uh, local, state, and federal um, elections. Uh, so we need to continue to tell that story because I, I can see that um, the intent of Democrats in Congress right now is to move in that direction. And I hope this is a very good lesson learned for many of my colleagues that represent more hyper-partisan districts to understand that the American people are sick and tired of the voters' wills in places like Iowa's 2nd District possibly being overturned by folks who have never been to Davenport or the Quad Cities, Moline included. We proved to voters that we can run really solid elections in Iowa, um, and we, we've worked hard to make sure we have good election law to do that. When you can show people that you have election integrity, that their vote counts, uh, that they're fairly represented, represented, more people will vote. So we need more election integrity, not less election integrity. We need more people talking about the things that we do well and how well states conduct their elections rather than people trying to accuse other people of suppressing vote when in, in fact the exact opposite is happening. And I'm just going to say again, having won by six votes the closest election, the third closest election in a century, every vote counts.